Hello, Clinic Review family. It's Dr. Sharon with Clinic Reviews, the very best, in my opinion, and clicks review in the entire world, if you're asking me my opinion. Uh, welcome to another PEDS video. Pediatrics is my weakest area, so I'm going to be doing questions that may not seem that high level with you, but they're things that I would need to review if I were getting ready for NCLEX, so we're going to do those, and it's, on, it's going to be a refresher from the last video. You'll see a link to the previous video uh, if you need to go back and refresh it, and we're going to do some additional PEDS stuff. Make sure you join our members only. You can get a special icon next to your name, so you make sure you get responses to your comments. And also once a month live stream, once a month video for our members only, where we'll be doing some questions and answering. I'll be doing NCLEX style questions just for you, and I'll answer any questions that you might have. And you can also suggest the topic that you want me to cover for that live stream. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Here we go. While conducting a newborn assessment, the nurse observes the following during the skin assessment. The nurse describes this as what? Erythema toxicum neonatorum, Mongolian spot, nevus hemangema. All right. So uh, I think we can rule out Mongolian spot. We, even if you don't know what it is, you probably can guess it's not something that looks like this. Um, nevus is red, hemangema is red, and erythema toxicum neonatorum is red. So which one is this? This is actually hemangema. Okay, so erythema toxicum neonatorum is the red rash that kind of is over the patient, the, the baby's uh, trunk, usually trunk and extremities, a little bit maybe on the face. It looks more like just kind of a a rash and um, it goes away in a couple days. And then a nevus is actually a birthmark. Um, and that can take, it may never go away and people can get it removed if they want to later in life, but it doesn't really go away. The, the hemangema probably will be small when you first see it, but remember that it can grow over the course of the first year and then it will eventually get smaller. So in the initial neonatal period, it may be quite small actually, sort of more like this, and then it can grow. So um, that's what you would wanna call that, okay? Let me see if it helps to make this bigger for you. So you can kind of tell it's not a rash, right? This is not, this, this is too red to be a rash, rashes, are red, but they're not this red. And a birthmark um, tends to not look quite this kind of, um, what do I want to say? It's kind of bumpy. Mangemas are a little bump, more bumpy looking, right? Um, birthmarks are not that, that bumpy looking. All right. After traumatic birth, a neonate is observed to have caput succedaneum, which of the following statements shows that the mother understands the implication of this finding. I must watch this closely as it could harm my child's intellectual development. This is normal and will go away over the next several days. This is very rare and I will need to follow up with a neurologist. I wish he wasn't in the NICU, but I understand how life-threatening this is. So caput succedaneum, remember we talked about uh, cephalohematoma, which does not cross the suture lines, and caput succedaneum, which does cross the suture lines. So it's what happens when you have a traumatic birth and you kind of get this swollen kind of top of the head or swollen somewhere, and it can make the baby's head look, you know, kind of funny, right? Because it's sort of a traumatic birth. And remember, when we talked about normal variations of the newborn, I said, if you have the option to call it normal, call it normal. Don't call it dangerous or life-threatening unless you know for sure that it's dangerous or life-threatening. And we do have the option to call it normal. So we are going to call this normal. And all the variations of the newborn that we talked about in the previous video are all normal, including the hemangema. So I'm not going over all of the normal variations of the newborn from the previous video, because you can do that in the previous video. I'm just testing you randomly on two of them. Let's do a couple more questions that are not related to skin changes. A mother who is breastfeeding her infant feels she may have mastitis. What symptoms would the nurse anticipate seeing? Burning and pain upon urination, warm, tender, and hardened area on one breast, pain, foul-smelling discharge, and low-grade fever, tachycardia, foul-smelling lochia, and uterine tenderness. So here is a question that is not particularly difficult, but you have to know your vocabulary. I've said this before, I'll say it again. 
As long as I've known Mark Klimek, he has said, vocabulary is the number one reason people fail NCLEX. So if you don't know the vocabulary, even though this is not a difficult question, you could get it wrong just because you don't know the vocabulary. So mastitis is an inflammation of the breast. It is not an infection. It is not an infection. So that which ones are related to the breast? Well, one is not related to the breast. So we're going to cross that off. And four is not related to the breast. You might say, well, uterine tenders, but what's lochia? Lochia is the vaginal drainage after delivery. So even if it's foul smelling lochia, that has nothing to do with the breast. So we're going to cross off four. So three and two are really the only ones that could mean anything. Two has the word breast in it, which I like. Three indicates an infection and mastitis is not an infection, y'all. They can continue to breastfeed even with mastitis. So it is not an infection. There's no foul smelling discharge. So the correct answer here is two. Make sure that when you're taking the NCLEX, you're using your common sense. That is so important. You think through the words. This is not a test where you automatically know the answer to every question. That is one of the biggest mistakes test takers make is they say, well, I don't know the answer, so I must be stupid. No, you're not stupid. Read the words. What words do you know? Find the answer that close, more, most closely reflects the words of the question. And if it's mastitis, don't pick a urinary answer. All right. The child has developed a butterfly rash. That's the butterfly rash right here on the face, arthritis and photosensitivity, which conditions should be explored now. Oh, sorry. Let me read the answers. Graves disease. Always read the answers before you decide what the answer is. Graves disease, hay fever, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus erythematosus. So let's go ahead and cross off hay fever and let's cross off Graves disease. Graves disease is hyperthyroidism. Okay. Graves disease is hyperthyroidism. Uh, hyperthyroidism is characterized by, think of the engine revving too fast. Okay. So the engine is revving too fast. You're going to have a high heart rate, high blood pressure, high respiratory rate, high body temperature. Um, they're going to have trouble gaining weight, but in an, in a child, um, you don't see it a lot in children. You can see it. You don't see it a lot. Certainly arthritis, butterfly rash, photosensitivity are not related to Graves' disease at all. So Graves' disease is revving the engine too fast. It's hyperthyroidism. All right. One is out. Two is out because hay fever doesn't have arthritis or a butterfly rash. All right. So one of the things about this question is it has the word arthritis in the question and three has the word arthritis in the answer. And normally, if I don't know the answer, I pick the answer that is most closely associated with the words in the question. So I'm super tempted by number three. However, I personally am an adult nurse and I know the classic, classic symptom of lupus is a butterfly rash. If you don't know that, that you should know that. That's fundamental information that like every nurse knows. All right. So I know classic symptom of lupus is a butterfly rash. And so I say to myself, well, can a kid get lupus? I don't know. I know lupus can have arthritic pain. Um, I'm not as familiar with the photosensitivity associated with lupus, but I know the butterfly rash is classic lupus. And so what I would rather do is I would rather pick the answer I know than the answer I'm not sure about, because I'm not sure if juvenile rheumatoid arthritis has a butterfly rash, but I know lupus has a butterfly rash. Okay. So I'm going to pick the answer I know has a butterfly rash than the answer I'm not sure if it has a butterfly rash. I don't know of any other disorder that has a butterfly rash as a part of it. And since I'm this isn't something I'm familiar with. I'm not a peds nurse. I don't know whether kids can get lupus, but I do know the symptoms are those of lupus. So I'm going to pick that. So one of the principles you have to remember when you're taking NCLEX is pick the answer that is most familiar rather than the one that you're like, I'm not sure about that. Right. And you say, I know butterfly rash goes with lupus. So I'm going to go ahead and pick it. <laughs> The nurse brushes an infant's cheek near the corner of the mouth, which reflex is the nurse assessing in the infant. Infant, moral reflex, rooting reflex, Babinski reflex, or tonic 
neck, neck reflex. Now you might go, oh, Sharon, this is pretty easy. I can't believe you put this one on here. Okay, but you've got to understand if you're not a peds nurse and I am not a peds nurse, it's easy to be distracted by the other answers. And I go, I don't know what the Moro reflex is. I think I know what the Babinski reflex is. And I'm pretty sure that's not it, right? You don't do, this is not Babinski. So I'm crossing that one off. Tonic neck reflex, like I don't even know what that is, right? But tonic neck reflex, like I'm pretty sure you don't do this in the cheek to do something with the neck. Okay, so I'm crossing off three and four, but I don't know what the Moro reflex is. I, I'm being honest with you. As a as a adult nurse, we don't do Moro reflex. So I'm like maybe, and and when I'm taking a test and I don't know what one is, you know what I'm super tempted to do? Pick the answer I'm not sure about. Go well, I don't know. It could be Moro. However, when I know rooting reflex is the one that we go to get the feeding, right? I do know that much. I don't know much, but I do know the rooting reflex is like, rah, 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 I want to eat. I want to eat, right? I'm rooting for the nipple. So that makes the most sense to me. So instead of picking the answer I've never heard of, I'm going to pick the answer that makes the most sense to me. So just so you know, correct answer is rooting reflex. Moral reflex is a startle reflex. Babinski reflex is stroking the lateral sole of the foot. And tonic neck reflex is some weird thing where they lay them on their front and they turn their chin toward the shoulder. I have no idea why they do that. No idea. So that's why I didn't put anything there. Don't know why. Okay. So I hope you're getting what you're picking up here is we use the words in the question to guide us in picking the right answer when we're not absolutely 100% sure of this. Now, this one I decided to put in here because you can get ordering questions and I hate ordering questions. So if I see an ordering question, then I think, you know what, that seems relatively basic. Um, I'm going to put it on here because the key thing is you got to get the fundamental questions right, y'all. Fundamentals. Don't spend all your time focusing on the most complicated multi-system organ dysfunction. Don't spend all your time on that. Spend your time on the fundamentals. And this seems pretty fundamental. How do I know the baby's got good reflexes, right? That seems pretty fundamental. So arrange the events in the order, sorry, arrange the events related to visual acuity in an infant in the order in which they occur. The infant is able to fixate on an object. The infant reacts to light by constricting the pupils. The infant is able to move both eyes in unison. The infant is able to blink in response to bright light. The infant is able to follow a light source with the eyes. So I'm not a pediatric nurse, but I know that if I check pupillary reflex and if pupillary reflex is no longer present, this person is in bad shape. Like pupillary reflex is like one of the very last things to go. Probably the only thing that goes after that is just their, and I forget what it's called, but it was where you touch the, the eye and, and it and they don't even blink, right? Like you're touching, like I can't touch my eye without blinking, but if you can touch someone's eye without blinking, they're neurologically probably not at all around. So, but even right before that, you lose pupillary response. So I'm going to go with what I know as an adult nurse. I'm going to say the infant reacts to light first, because that makes the most sense. Now, when I think about adults, what would I expect them? Can they fixate on an object? Well, being able to fixate on an object, again, when I think about doing a neuro assessment on a patient, that's a little higher level being able to fixate. So they're able to move both eyes in unison. That also seems a little higher level. Able to blink. See, blinking in response to light, that seems pretty low level. So they just, they constrict and then they blink in response to light and then they follow a light source. That doesn't seem like the next. So I think the next one is able to blink in response to a bright light. That seems pretty basic. So they've got pupillary response. They blink in response to light. Now, what I expect them to be able to fixate on an object, to be able to both move both eyes in unison, that's pretty neurologically uh higher functioning for an infant, not necessarily for an adult, but for an infant that's a little higher level, able to follow a light source with the eye. That's really high level. So do I think, what do I think is the lowest level? I would think being able to fixate on an object would be the next one. Okay. So being able to, so they can just focus in on an object. And you'll notice when a baby's first born, they can't do that. They don't even really, I mean, they might look at you 
when they're like when they're feeding, maybe they'll look at you, but they don't really seem to see you. Have you ever noticed that? Like, like my, when my daughter had her first uh, child, I remember it took her a while to feel like she was really bonding with the baby because she felt like he didn't really know who she was. Like he didn't even know she was somebody special to him. Right. I mean, it was nice because she fed him and she cuddled him and she changed his diaper and she kept him warm, but he didn't seem to really view her as anything special. And that's because babies don't really look at you, right? I mean, they kind of, well, they're fine, but like, who are you? It, it takes a while for them to recognize you. And that's that being able to fixate on an object. It takes a little while to be able to do that. Now, what would be higher level? Move both eyes in unison or uh, follow a light source with with the eye. Actually, what's next? This one's not as obvious to me, but they're able to follow light source with the eyes actually next, and then able to move both eyes in unison. So it is sort of a unique thing about babies is their eyes don't seem to move in unison until they're a little bit older, a um, couple months old, actually. And then uh, until then, they're like, my eyes are a little wacko, right? All right. So that's the end. That's the order of that. And I hope that you have a great rest of your week. We're going to continue focusing on peds this month. Maybe we're going to do that because my daughter-in-law just had a baby an hour ago. And my daughter is getting ready to have a baby in about two weeks. So maybe I'm in the mood to do peds this month. That's probably why. All right. Love you guys. Hey, I uh, hope you have a great rest of your week and I'll see you later.